Hey, Cody Rawl here with Tech for Psych. Today, I had a bit of a history lesson for you guys. Now, if you can, I want you to picture that you're in the year 1848. By now, the Industrial Revolution has completely revolutionized America into a manufacturing superhouse. The daguerreotype has become the first widespread photographic technique in the history of the world. And in Vermont, a young man named Phineas Gage was working on a railroad. Now, Gage was a construction railroad foreman, and part of his job was to clear rocky outcroppings for the incoming railroad in Vermont. Part of his job involved boring holes into rocky outcroppings and stuffing them with blasting powder, sand, and a fuse in preparation for a blast. On September 13th, Gage was working on a particular rocky outcropping. He had drilled the hole and put in the blasting powder. Now, to compress the contents, he had a long tamping iron, which is a three foot long iron rod that weighed about 13 pounds. In the afternoon on that day, Gage was packing down the contents and actually hit the side of the hole, causing a spark. This ignited the blasting powder, sending the rod through his left cheek and out the top of his head. As you can imagine, the explosion knocked Gage backwards and onlookers rushed to his side. He had several convulsions after that, but amazingly, within a couple of minutes, he started talking and walking around. Now, the other people at the work site obviously decided to take him back into town to get seen by the doctors. It was about three quarters of a mile back, and he was seen by doctors Williams and Harlow. Much of what we know about this incident comes from the writings of Harlow. The doctors examined the wound, and Harlow actually had overheard Gage telling his friends about what had happened and didn't believe him. It's hard to believe that someone that had a 13 pound iron rod blasted through their head would be up walking and talking within an hour or two. But as Harlow examined the wound, he did see the exit wound on top of his head as well as the entry wound on his left cheek. Now Harlow cleaned the wound and bandaged Gage. He then became more reassured that this had actually happened when Gage became uh, sick and started vomiting pieces of brain on the floor. How gross is that? So Gage did well during the day, but as his brain started to swell over the next couple of days, he started to deteriorate. He went into a nearly comatose state and Harlow cared for him for several weeks. He actually developed a brain abscess at one time that Harlow had to drain, saving Gage's life. But within a couple of months by November, Gage was okay to return to his parents' home and start trying to work again. Now, this case became the first traumatic brain injury case that attempted to show phrenology. Now, phrenology is localization of brain activity to different parts of the brain. And Harlow had been trained in this in the early 1800s. It's a very primitive form of brain localization that tried to explain different aspects of behavior, emotion, and personality according to the area of the brain that these processes were located. Harlow theorized that the rod going through Gage's left frontal lobe resulted in his behavior that was seen after the incident. Eyewitness accounts said that Gage had originally been a reliable and courteous man, but after the accident, he became unreliable. He came, became profane, and he could not hold back from fulfilling his animalistic tendencies. Now, this case became known as the American Crowbar Case, and it became the poster child for neurolocalization. The interesting thing about this study was that for over 100 years, this was the best way we knew how to understand brain function. Basically, what, ha what would happen is either someone would get a specific infection, uh, have a tumor, or have a surgical intervention that affected the, a part of their brain, followed by observational studies, and finally, a confirmation autopsy report that would show that the area of the brain affected actually had caused the behavioral changes or even personality changes in the case. Now, when Freud was doing his work, he obviously just had this sort of data to go off of. And one of the reasons I do these videos is that I see an accelerating amount of technology that's being developed today that is going to completely revolutionize our understanding of brain function. Not until the 1970s were we even able to see a still picture of the brain. And this was the CAT scan with very poor resolution. Later on in the 1980s, MRI became more widespread where we could actually see some details that were actually worth seeing. 
And then not until the 1990s did we actually have functional MRI where we were able to see the brain function in with a time lag, as I described in my other videos, with change in, in oxygen in the, in the blood levels. Now, only until now, with the combination of EEG, MEG, and fMRI, are we able to get a better picture of a real-time functioning of brain function. This has only occurred within the last decade or so. So what we're going to see is an explosion in science, technology, and understanding of brain function. Obama just put hundreds of millions of dollars into the NIH in order to study the brain. And in a report released in June, they announced that the first five to 10 years are merely going to be spent just on developing technologies that are able to see the brain function at a higher level. Now, I'll be coming to you guys with future videos as NIH and other facilities develop their techniques and their technology to investigate the brain further. I hope you enjoyed today's video and I really appreciate your comments. There's been a lot of good comments lately. Keep them coming. This is Cody Rall with Tech for Psych. I'll see you next time. Thanks.